Book Three, Chapter One, Volume One of Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume One, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book Three, Chapter One. In the beginning of Arthur, after he was chosen king by adventure and by grace, for the most part of the barons knew not that he was Uther Pendragon's son, but as Merlin made it openly known. But yet many kings and lords held great war against him for that cause, but well Arthur overcame them all, for the most part the days of his life he was ruled much by the counsel of Merlin. So it fell on a time, King Arthur said unto Merlin, My barons will let me have no rest, but needs I must take a wife, and I will take none but by thy counsel and by thine advice. It is well done, said Merlin, that ye take a wife, for a man of your bounty and noblesse should not be without a wife. Now is there any that ye love more than another? Yea, said King Arthur, I love Guinevere, the king's daughter, Leodegrance of the land of Cameliard, the which holdeth in his house the table round that ye told he had of my father Uther. And this demoiselle is the most valiant and fairest lady that I know living, or yet ever I could find. Sir, said Merlin, as of her beauty and fairness, she is one of the fairest alive. But, an ye loved her not so well as ye do, I should find you a damosel of beauty and of goodness that should like you and please you, and your heart were not set. But there, as a man's heart is set, he will be loath to return. That is truth, said King Arthur. But Merlin warned the king covertly that Guinevere was not wholesome for him to take to wife for he warned him that Lancelot should love her, and she him again, and so he turned his tale to the adventures of Sangreal. Then Merlin desired of the king for to have men with him that should inquire of Guinevere, and so the king granted him, and Merlin went forth unto King Leodegrance of Cameliard, and told him of the desires of the king, that he would have unto his wife Guinevere his daughter. That is to me, said King Leodegrance, the best tidings that ever I heard, that so worthy a king of prowess and noblesse will wed my daughter. And as for my lands, I will give him, wist I it might please him, but he hath lands enow, him needeth none, but I shall send him a gift shall please him much more, for I shall give him the table round, the which Uther Pendragon gave me. And when it is full complete, there is a hundred knights and fifty. And as for an hundred good knights, I have myself, but I have fought fifty, for so many have been slain in my days. And so Leodegrance delivered his daughter Guinevere unto Merlin, and the table round with a hundred knights, and so they rode freshly with great royalty, what by water and what by land, till that they came nigh unto London. CHAPTER Two. When King Arthur heard of the coming of Guinevere and the hundred knights with the table round, then King Arthur made great joy for her coming, and that rich present, and said openly, This fair lady is passing welcome unto me, for I have loved her long, and therefore there is nothing so lief to me. And these knights with the round table please me more than right great riches. And in all haste the king let ordain for the marriage, and the coronation in the most honourable wise that could be devised. Now, Merlin, said King Arthur, go thou and espy me in all this land fifty knights, which be of the most prowess and worship. Within short time Merlin had found such knights that should fulfil twenty and eight knights, but no more he could find. Then the Bishop of Canterbury was fetched, and he blessed the sieges with great royalty and devotion, and there set the eight and twenty knights in their sieges. And when this was done Merlin said, 
Fair sirs, ye must all arise and come to King Arthur for to do him homage. He will have the better will to maintain you. And so they arose and did their homage, and when they were gone Merlin found in every sieges letters of gold that told the knights' names that had sitten therein. But two sieges were void, and so anon came young Gawain and offered the king a gift. Ask, said the king, and I shall grant it you. Sir, I ask that ye will make me knight that same day ye shall wed fair Guinevere. I will do it with a good will, said King Arthur, and do unto you all the worship that I may, for I must by reason ye are my nephew, my sister's son. Chapter 3 For withal there came a poor man into the court, and brought with him a fair young man of eighteen years of age, riding upon a lean mare. And the poor man asked all men that he met, Where shall I find King Arthur? Yonder he is, said the knights, wilt thou anything with him? Yea, said the poor man, therefore I came hither. Anon as he came before the king, he saluted him and said, O King Arthur, the flower of all knights and kings, I beseech Jesu save thee. Sir, it was told me that at this time of your marriage you would give any man the gift that he would ask, out except that were unreasonable. That is truth, said the king, such cries I let make, and that will I hold, so it appear not my realm nor mine estate. Ye say well and graciously, said the poor man. Sir, I ask nothing else but that ye will make my son here a knight. It is a great thing thou askest of me, said the king. What is thy name, said the king to the poor man? Sir, my name is Ares the cowherd. Whether cometh this of thee or of thy son? said the king. Nay, sir, said Ares, this desire cometh of my son and not of me, for I shall tell you I have thirteen sons, and all they will fall to what labour I put them, and will be right glad to do labour. But this child will not labour for me, for anything that my wife or I may do, but always he will be shooting or casting darts and glad for to see battles, and to behold knights, and always day and night he desireth of me to be made a knight. What is thy name? said the king unto the young man. Sir, my name is Tor. The king beheld him fast, and saw he was passingly well visaged, and passingly well made of his years. Well, said King Arthur unto Ares the cowherd, fetch all thy sons afore me, that I may see them. And so the poor man did, and all were shaped much like the poor man. But Tor was not like none of them all in shape nor in countenance, for he was much more than any of them. Now, said King Arthur unto the cowherd, where is the sword he shall be made knight withal? It is here, said Tor. Take it out of the sheath, said the king, and require me to make you a knight. Then Tor alighted off his mare and pulled out his sword, kneeling, and requiring the king that he would make him knight, and that he might be a knight of the table round. As for a knight I will make you, and therewith smote him in the neck with the sword, saying, Be ye a good knight, and so I pray to God, so ye may be. And if ye be of prowess and of worthiness, ye shall be a knight of the table round." Now, Merlin, said Arthur, say whether this Tor shall be a good knight or no. Yea, sir, he ought to be a good knight, for he is come of as good a man as any is alive, and of king's blood. How so, sir? said the king. I shall tell you, said Merlin, this poor man, Ares the cowherd, is not his father. He is nothing sib to him, for King Pellinore is his father. I suppose nay, said the cowherd. Fetch thy wife afore me, said Merlin, and she shall not say nay. Anon the wife was fetched, which was a fair housewife, and there she answered Merlin full womanly, and there she told the king and Merlin that when she was a maid, and went to milk kine, 
there met with her a stern knight, and half by force he had my maidenhead, and at that time he begat my son Tor. And he took away from me my greyhound that I had that time with me, and said that he would keep the greyhound for my love. Ah, said the cowherd, I weaned not this, but I may believe it well, for he had never no tatches of me. Sir, said Tor unto Merlin, dishonour not my mother. Sir, said Merlin, it is more for your worship than hurt, for your father is a good man and a king, and he may right well advance you and your mother, for ye were begotten or ever she was wedded. That is a truth, said the wife. It is the less grief unto me, said the cowherd. Chapter 4 So on the morn King Pellinore came to the court of King Arthur, which had great joy of him, and told of Tor, how he was his son, and how he had made him knight at the request of the cowherd. When Pellinore beheld Tor, he pleased him much. So the king made Gawain knight, but Tor was the first he made at the feast. "'What is the cause,' said King Arthur, "'that there be two places void in the sieges?' "'Sir,' said Merlin, "'there shall no man sit in those places "'but they that shall be of most worship. "'But in the siege perilous "'there shall no man sit therein but one, "'and if there be any so hardy to do it, "'he shall be destroyed.' and he that shall sit there shall have no fellow. And therewith Merlin took King Pellinore by the hand, and in the one hand next, the two sieges and the siege perilous, he said, in open audience, This is your place, and best ye are worthy to sit therein, of any that is here. Thereat sat Sir Gawain in great envy, and told Gaheris his brother, Yonder knight is put to great worship, the which grieveth me sore, for he slew our father King Lot. Therefore I will slay him, said Gawain, with a sword that was sent me that is passing trenchant. Ye shall not so, said Gaheris, at this time, for at this time I am but a squire, and when I am made knight I will be avenged on him. And therefore, brother, it is best ye suffer till another time, that we may have him out of the court, for an we did so we should trouble this high feast. I will well, said Gawain, as ye will. Chapter 5 When was the high feast made ready, and the king was wedded at Camelot unto Dame Guinevere in the church of St. Stephen's, with great solemnity? And as every man was set after his degree, Merlin went to all the knights of the round table, and bade them sit still, that none of them remove. For ye shall see a strange and a marvellous adventure. Right so as they sat, there came running in a white heart into the hall, and a white bracket next him, and thirty couple of black running hounds came after with a great cry and the heart went about the table round as he went by other boards. The white bracket bit him by the buttock, and pulled out a piece, wherethrough the heart leaped a great leap, and overthrew a knight that sat at the board side. And therewith the knight arose and took up the bracket, and so went forth out of the hall, and took his horse, and rode his way with the bracket. Right so anon came in a lady on a white palfrey, and cried aloud to King Arthur, Sir, suffer me not to have this despite, for the bracket was mine that the knight led away. I may not do therewith, said the king. With this there came a knight riding all armed on a great horse, and took the lady away with him with force, and ever she cried and made great dole. When she was gone, the king was glad, for she made such a noise. Nay, said Merlin, ye may not leave these adventures so lightly, for these adventures must be brought again, or else it would be disworship to you and to your feast. I will, said the king, that all be done by your advice. Then, said Merlin, let call Sir Gawain, for he must bring again the white heart. 
Also, sir, ye must let call Sir Tor, for he must bring again the brocket and the knight, or else slay him. Also let call King Pellinore, for he must bring again the lady and the knight, or else slay him. And these three knights shall do marvellous adventures, or they come again. Then were they called all three, as it rehearseth afore, and each of them took his charge, and armed them surely. But Sir Gawain had the first request, and therefore we will begin at him. CHAPTER Six. Sir Gawain rode more than a pace, and Gaheris his brother that rode with him instead of a squire to do him service. So as they rode they saw two knights fight on horseback passing sore. So Sir Gawain and his brother rode betwixt them, and asked them for what cause they fought so. The one knight answered and said, We fight for a simple matter, for we two be two brethren born and begotten of one man and of one woman. Alas, said Sir Gawain, why do ye so? Sir, said the elder, there came a white hart this way, this day, and many hounds chased him, and a white brocket was always next him, and we understood it was adventure made for the high feast of King Arthur, and therefore I would have gone after to have won me worship, and here my younger brother said he would go after the hart, for he was better knight than I, and for this cause we fell at debate, and so we thought to prove which of us both was better knight. This is a simple cause, said Sir Gawain. Uncouth men ye should debate with all, and not brother with brother. Therefore, but if ye will do by my counsel, I will have ado with you. That is, ye shall yield you unto me, and that ye go unto King Arthur, and yield you unto his grace. Sir Knight, said the two brethren, we are forefoughten, and much blood have we lost through our willfulness, and therefore we would be loath to have ado with you. Then do as I will have you, said Sir Gawain. We will agree to fulfill your will. But by whom shall we say that we be thither sent? Ye may say, by the knight that followeth the quest of the heart that was white. Now what is your name? said Gawain. Sir Luce of the Forest, said the elder. And my name is, said the younger, Brian of the Forest. And so they departed and went to the king's court, and Sir Gawain on his quest. And as Gawain followed the hart by the cry of the hounds, even afore him there was a great river, and the hart swam over. And as Sir Gawain would follow after, there stood a knight over the other side, and said, Sir knight, come not over after this hart, but if thou wilt joust with me. I will not fail as for that, said Sir Gawain to follow the quest that I am in, and so made his horse to swim over the water. And anon they gat their spears, and ran together full hard. But Sir Gawain smote him off his horse, and then he turned his horse, and bade him yield him. Nay, said the knight, not so, though thou have the better of me on horseback. I pray thee, valiant knight, a light afoot, and match we together with swords. What is your name? said Sir Gawain. Alardin of the Isles, said the other. Then either dressed their shields and smote together, but Sir Gawain smote him so hard through the helm that it went to the brains, and the knight fell down dead. Ah! said Gaheris, that was a mighty stroke of a young knight. Chapter 7 then Gawain and Gaheris rode more than a pace after the white hart, and let slip at the hart three couple of greyhounds, and so they chased the hart into a castle, and in the chief place of the castle they slew the hart. Sir Gawain and Gaheris followed after. Right so there came a knight out of a chamber with a sword drawn in his hand, and slew two of the greyhounds, even in the sight of Sir Gawain, and the remnant he chased them with his sword out of the castle. And when he came again, he said, O oh, my white heart, me repenteth that thou art dead, for my sovereign lady gave thee to me, and evil have I kept thee, and thy death shall be dear-bought, and I live. And anon he went into his chamber, and armed him, and came out fiercely, and there met he with Sir Gawain. 
"'Why have ye slain my hounds?' said Sir Gawaine. "'For they did but their kind, and liefer I had ye had broken your anger upon me than upon a dumb beast.' "'Thou sayest truth,' said the knight. "'I have avenged me on thy hounds, and so I will on thee, or thou go.' Then Sir Gawain alighted afoot, and dressed his shield, and struck together mightily, and clave their shields, and stoned their helms, and brake their hauberks that the blood ran down to their feet. At the last Sir Gawain smote the knight so hard that he fell to the earth, and then he cried mercy, and yielded him, and besought him, as he was a knight and gentleman, to save his life. "'Thou shalt die,' said Sir Gawain, "'for slaying of my hounds. "'I will make amends,' said the knight, "'unto my power.' "'Sir Gawain would no mercy have, "'but unlaced his helm to have stricken off his head. "'Right so came his lady out of a chamber "'and fell over him, "'and so he smote off her head by misadventure. "'Alas!' said Gaheris, "'that is foully and shamefully done, "'that shame shall never from you.' Also ye should give mercy unto them that ask mercy, for a knight without mercy is without worship. Sir Gawain was so stonied of the death of this fair lady, that he wist not what he did, and said unto the knight, Arise, I will give thee mercy. Nay, nay, said the knight, I take no force of mercy now, for thou hast slain my love and my lady that I loved best of all earthly things. Me sore repenteth it, said Sir Gawain, for I thought to strike unto thee, but now thou shalt go unto King Arthur and tell him of thine adventures, and how thou art overcome by the knight that went in the quest of the white heart. I take no force, said the knight, whether I live or I die, but so for dread of death he swore to go unto King Arthur, and he made him to bear one greyhound before him on his horse, and another behind him. "'What is your name?' said Sir Gawain. "'Or we depart.' "'My name is,' said the knight, "'Ablamar of the Marsh.' So he departed toward Camelot. Chapter 8 And Sir Gawain went into the castle, and made him ready to lie there all night, and would have unarmed him. "'What will ye do?' said Gaheris. "'Will ye unarm you in this country?' Ye may think ye have many enemies here. They had not sooner said that word, but there came four knights well armed, and assailed Sir Gawain hard, and said unto him, Thou new-made knight, thou hast shamed thy knighthood, for a knight without mercy is dishonoured. Also thou hast slain a fair lady to thy great shame to the world's end, and doubt thou not, thou shalt have great need of mercy, or thou depart from us and therewith one of them smote Sir Gawain a great stroke, that nigh he fell to the earth, and Gaheris smote him again sore, and so they were on the one side and on the other, that Sir Gawain and Gaheris were in jeopardy of their lives, and one with a bow, an archer, smote Sir Gawain through the arm, that it grieved him wonderly sore. And as they should have been slain, there came four fair ladies, and besought the knights of grace for Sir Gawain, and goodly at request of the ladies they gave Sir Gawain and Gaheris their lives, and made them to yield them as prisoners. Then Gawain and Gaheris made great dole. Alas, said Sir Gawain, mine arm grieveth me sore, I am like to be maimed, and so made his complaint piteously. Early on the morrow, there came to Sir Gawain one of the fair ladies that had heard all his complaint, and said, Sir Knight, what cheer? Not good, said he. It is your own default, said the lady, for ye have done a passing foul deed in the slaying of the lady, the which will be great villainy unto you. But be ye not of King Arthur's kin? said the lady. Yes, truly, said Sir Gawain. But what is your name? said the lady. You must tell it me, or you pass. My name is Gawain, the King Lot of Orkney's son, and my mother is King Arthur's sister. Ah, then are ye nephew unto King Arthur, said the lady, 
and I shall so speak for you that ye shall have conduct to go to King Arthur for his love. And so she departed, and told the four knights how their prisoner was King Arthur's nephew, and his name is Sir Gawain, King Lot's son of Orkney. And they gave him the heart's head because it was in his quest. Then anon they delivered Sir Gawain under this promise, that he should bear the dead lady with him in this manner. The head of her was hanged around his neck, and the whole body of her lay before him on his horse's mane. Right so rode he forth unto Camelot. And anon as he was come, Merlin desired of King Arthur that Sir Gawain should be sworn to tell of all his adventures, and how he slew the lady, and how he would give no mercy unto the knight, wherethrough the lady was slain. Then the king and the queen were greatly displeased with Sir Gawain for the slaying of the lady. And there, by ordinance of the queen, there was set a quest of ladies on Sir Gawain. And they judged him, for ever while he lived, to be with all ladies, and to fight for their quarrels, and that ever he should be courteous, and never to refuse mercy to him that asketh mercy. Thus was Gawain sworn upon the four evangelists, that he should never be against lady nor gentlewoman, but if he fought for a lady, and his adversary fought for another. And thus endeth the adventure of Sir Gawain that he did at the marriage of King Arthur. Amen. End of Book 3, Chapter 8